Only 15% that watch my videos are subscribed. Please don't forget to if you like my content. This helps me out a lot. Enjoy the video. The girl lay shivering in the corner. The floor was hard concrete, and the room dark, cold, and getting colder. Even though she was in a deep basement, she could still hear the wind outside. It must have been a raging blizzard for her to notice. She tried to roll her emaciated naked body onto her other side, but the chain and shackle attached tightly to her right wrist did not allow for much movement. The scraps of cloth and rags that the beast had given her did little to retain her tiny body's heat. As always, she was starving. The bones lying about had been gnawed down to nothing, and with her teeth now sore constantly, the bones would stay as they are. She was torn between her desire for the beast to return with enough food to give her a few scraps and her hopes that he would freeze out on the surface, which would end her continuing torment. She had been miserable, hungry, beaten, and abused for so many months that she no longer dreamed of what once was. Her world had been reduced to pain, hunger, and cold. Now, when the beast used her body for his pleasure, she no longer felt the humiliation, or the shame, or even the guilt. All that had been replaced by the relief for the slight bit of body heat the beast imparted as he worked on top of her. Sometimes he would collapse on her afterward, and for a while, the cold was lessened. Ah. She heard the outer hatchway opening and rolled her head towards the door. It opened, and the beast appeared, pausing to carefully scan the basement. His eyes did not linger on her once they noted she was still alive. After dismissing any threats, the beast entered the basement. He carried a bulging sack and was dragging a frozen carcass of what looked like a dog. The beast tossed the carcass over near her but just out of her reach. She stared at it with a bit of shame as she started salivating. The beast left the basement to return to the surface. He soon returned with an armload of wood and twigs and set about getting the small iron stove lit. The fire would be small as he was miserly with the fuel. The beast then started to sort the sack and set the frozen cans of food it contained to one side. One had split open but the frozen contents were still worth eating and it was placed on the stove in a pan to thaw and warm. Some short time later the girl was shaken awake. The beast held a cup of warmed water and proceeded to let the girl sip a few mouthfuls. He then removed his bulky smelly clothing and piled them on the floor, pulling the girl onto the pile with the chain. He then presented himself to the girl so she could bring him fully erect with her mouth. Soon the beast was rutting away on top of the girl. She mostly ignored the motions as she enjoyed the heat of the clothing pile. The beast finished rather quickly and she was shoved back into the corner while he dressed. He brought her a bucket and demanded she use it. He then took it outside to toss the contents and returned inside with snow. This was set by the stove and would later be given to her for her to use to clean herself. As she waited, the beast opened the can which was now thawed and warm from the fire. The smell caused her stomach to clench and her hunger roared itself known. The beast quickly ate the bulk of the can and tossed the remains to her. She scrambled to catch it one-handed, luckily not spilling any. She quickly scooped the remains into her mouth with her small left hand, wiping the can and her fingers clean in the process. The beast had watched her the whole time, you're looking like shit, little girly. Getting mighty scrawny. Better eat up. It said with a toothy grin. She thought that the beast was not looking too good either. Another tooth was missing, and the sores covering its face had spread. She watched the beast get up and inspect the carcass, and then toss it closer to the stove to continue to thaw. As she stared at the pile of fur, she remembered her own dog. Misty had been a bit bigger than this one and she remembered the fun times she and Misty had had exploring the canyons and deserts nearby her family's home in St. George, Utah. When she had finally received her driver's license, Misty had been her only companion and protector on the quick overnight camping trips she would go on. They would drive miles out into the nearby state recreation lands in her father's old but sturdy Jeep. That had been before, before the world ended. It had ended both figuratively and literally. The figurative ending had come when she had been awakened in her family's cabin by the sounds of gunfire as her parents and Misty had been killed by the beast. Her father, a passive Mormon, had not fought back when the man had broken into their cabin. The man, this was before he became the beast, had quickly restrained her and sacked the cabin. 
She still remembered the terrible hike into the canyons east of her family's cabin. Her hands had been tied, and she had stumbled along with a large pack hung over her shoulders. She had watched the literal ending of the world on that hike. She had known that there were supposed to be a lot of meteors coming, and that they were going to destroy most of the world and kill a lot of people. But she couldn't possibly have imagined the fires and smoke, the panic and violence, death all around. It had been like a huge thunderstorm had been crossed with a forest fire and an earthquake. The skies had been terrible with gale winds and lightning, the blowing hot dust and gloom. Each breath choking her from the smoke of the burning town of St. George Miles behind them, the ground trembling and shaking. Eventually they had reached his den, this cellar bunker, and hunkered down. What followed became a new and even deeper hell on top of the hell her world had already become as her kidnapper began to take his pleasure from her many times a day. The days became weeks. The beast had beaten her every time she spoke or uttered a sound, and she grew silent and detached. Her only awareness was the feeding times which came every day or so. She remembered becoming very sick, both of them sick, for weeks. The food and water ran out about the time she started to recover. The temperature had dropped during that time, as the sun had not been seen since the night the devastation began. The frequent earthquakes had started to taper off at least. The beast had also recovered from his sickness and had started leaving her for days at a time, wandering the wasteland scavenging for food. The hunger grew as the infrequent meals became even smaller. She did not even notice when the meat which had been brought back had unthinkable shapes and very odd tastes. She was jarred from her recollections by the beast dressing in his cold weather layers. He must be going out to one of his secret caches of fuel or food. She watched him out of the corner of her eye as he opened the wooden hatch and began to climb the stairs. He had just closed the hatch behind him when, boom! The hatch came breaking inward as the beast was flung back inside, landing on the hard cellar floor. The girl flinched when she saw his ruined face where the buckshot load had taken him. Her heart beat faster as she stared at the open hatchway, but no one entered. The beast gurgled and made wet noises, and his body began its death rattle. Soon, the cellar was quiet. Nothing happened for minutes, no sounds on the stairs or no shadows moving beyond the ruined hatch. Suddenly, an empty tin can came flying in through the open hatch and landed, rattling around on the floor. After that, nothing happened for another minute. Finally, the girl heard the slow creaking of the stairs. Something was coming. She cowered in her corner, still and silent. Finally, she saw something. It was a small mirror that was fastened to a stick of some sort. The mirror turned and angled, whoever was behind it scanning the room. She saw an eyeball in the reflection as the mirror swiveled to her and paused for a long moment. Finally, a tall man in a hooded long coat stepped quickly in, scanning the room swiftly. He held a shotgun and alternated pointing it at her and the beast's corpse. After the man had swept the room, he approached her corner and knelt, studying her. Well, what do we have here? He muttered. He noted the chain and her bruised and raw wrist under the shackle. He used the gun to pull her rag blanket off of her, causing her to clutch herself in the cold air. You're not doing so hot, are you, little girl? He asked. The girl remained silent. She knew what happened when noises were made. Do you have a name? Can you talk? The man asked quickly. She hesitated, then quickly nodded, then shook her head. Huh. The man muttered. He quickly stood and grabbed her rag blanket, thankfully throwing it back on her. She watched as he ignored her and quickly went around the room looking everything over and scavenging for food or anything useful. Next, he searched the beast. After finding the beast's pistol, ammunition, and knife, the man stripped off all the beast's clothes. He picked through the pile and kept a few items. The rest he tossed onto her, causing her to scramble to cover more of her exposed body. Is there anyone else here? Anyone coming back? He asked quickly. She shook her head twice. You lying to me, little girl? He asked sharply, approaching her with his fist raised. She cowered back and shook her head harder. She then covered her face and head with her free hand. The man stepped back and considered her in the cellar for a while. He made a decision and then quickly left, going out the ruined hatch and up the stairs. After ten minutes, 
he returned with a large black dog and a small bundle of wood. He pointed at the corner and said stay, and the dog quickly went and complied. He left again and soon returned, this time dragging a large metal watering trough. He then proceeded to close and repair the hatch with a few scrap boards he had brought and some wire. When that was done, the man resumed rummaging through the beast's sack of food and scraps. He found a can of something and got the stove going with a bigger fire. Soon the man had more water heating and the contents of the can cooking. While he waited for the meal to heat, he inspected the carcass of the small dog. Quickly, he skinned the dog and removed the larger hind limbs. The rest he tossed over to the larger black dog in the corner. The remains of the carcass hit with a splat, but the dog did not react. Instead, it just stared at the man, waiting. The dog's jowls had begun to drip saliva when the man finally said, Eat. The dog pounced and began to tear the Halfrosin carcass apart, gorging itself. The man found one of the beast's dirty plates and poured half the contents of the can's contents on it. Looking at the girl, he asked, Can you use a spoon? The question confused the girl. It had been so long since she had used a spoon to eat. Could she? Not wanting to upset the man and risk losing the food, she quickly nodded. The man found a dirty spoon and set the plate and spoon near her corner. She just watched him, afraid to risk making him angry. Eat, he said with a chuckle and she lurched for the food. It was hard for her to use the spoon. First, she had to use her left hand and second, her hunger robbed her of patience. She forced herself to calm and slowly began to shovel the warm creamed corn into her mouth. The man had begun to eat the other half of the can when he stopped and said, Eat that slow girl. I reckon it's more than you've had for a while, and it would be a shame for you to puke it up. He took a few bits himself before looking back at her and adding, Although I bet you'd lick it right back up, you're so hungry. She ate as slow as she could but all too soon, the plate was empty. She licked it clean. After he had finished his meal, the man added water to the now empty can and swirled it around before drinking it dry. He then refilled the can halfway and brought it to the girl. Can you drink this without spilling? He asked. She nodded. He took her plate and gave her the can to drink. He then filled the plate with water and set it by the black dog. After that, the man bundled up and went back out. Soon he returned with more containers of snow and slush, which he set to heating on the stove. With that set, he sighed and proceeded to pull the beast's naked corpse up the stairs and out of the cellar. He came back down and retrieved his large knife and a small box of trash bags. He was gone for over an hour before returning with a bag containing a few pounds of raw meat. The rest must have been divided up and hidden outside, where it would soon freeze solid. Later, the man would have to carefully retrieve the parcels, always on the watch for predators, both the four- and two-legged kind. He washed his bloody arms and hands in one of the pans of melting water. The room was quickly warming with the stove fully fueled. The man kept pouring boiling water from the pans on the stove into the large watering trough he had brought down earlier. He then got up and stooped over the girl. Now, Missy, I am going to make you a deal. I am going to take that shackle off and I won't hurt you. You have to promise me that you won't try and hurt me, okay? The girl was confused but eventually gave a small nod in return. When you are free, I'm going to help you take a bath and get you cleaned up a bit. Then, we'll see about getting you into some of the old clothes that asshole has laying around upstairs. Now, you will be free and you can run away if you want, but know this. You will die out there faster than if you stay here. Understand? Again, the girl took a long time to nod. The tall man went and returned with the large metal shears. His strong arms bulged as he forced the shears to cut the shackle bands. With a pop, the shackle broke and he pulled the two parts apart enough for her to remove her mangled and scabbed right wrist. The girl looked at her wrist and just blinked, confused at what had just happened. The man stood up and she flinched back but he ignored her and went to tend the trough of warm water. She looked around confused. The big dog had finished gorging himself on the carcass and was now curled up in her old corner asleep. Uh, it's warm enough and there is enough for you to take a bath? Sorta. I even found some soap. Come here, girl, and sit in this tub. She just cringed back further, shivering. Girl, I won't hurt you, now come here, he said forcefully. 
Her body reacted before her mind did, and she quickly crawled over to him and began to step into the trough. The water felt scalding to her, although it was probably just warm. She ignored that, and soon almost collapsed from the joy of the warmth. The man began pouring more water over her, getting her dirty, stringy hair wet. He then rubbed a cake of soap in a wet rag and began to lather her hair and back. As he scrubbed away at her dirt, she flinched from the pain of washing her bruises. He then began to wash her hair, almost tenderly at times as he massaged her dirty scalp. He then rinsed her hair and gave her the soap and rag. Here you wash your face in front. Be careful with your wrist, though. Don't wash the scabs too hard. The man then went to heat more water. The girl looked at the soap and then with one hand managed to wrap the rag around the bar and began rubbing her front. Once the rag was fully lathered, she started on her face. As she cleaned herself, the girl noticed the water in the trough was filthy. But still, the warm water had stopped her chills for the first time in ages. When the girl went to wash her backside in privates, the rashes caused by laying in filth for so long hurt like hell. She tenderly washed the area as carefully as possible. Soon she was done with her own washing, and the man brought a new pan of water and slowly poured it over her head, letting it stream through her hair and down her back. The girl almost whimpered at how wonderful it felt. He looked at her face and body. Looks like you're as clean as you're going to get. Here is a towel that is not too dirty. Stand up, and I will help you dry. He had to help the girl stand and then began to dry her quickly. He did not hesitate to dry every part of her body, but he did it in a clinical way. Once she was dry, he pointed to a pile of clothes he had found in a box. Find enough to wear in that pile. Can you dress yourself one-handed? The girl thought about it and nodded. The man then poured the last of the water into the trough and began to undress. As she picked through the clothing and struggled into the few items that would fit her, the girl could not help glancing at the tall naked man. His body was much skinnier and healthier than the beast's had been. He had the same sores that the beast had had, but fewer. There was also an angry red rope of a scar running down his back. And, although he was dirty, he did not smell as bad as the beast had. The man finally was naked and sat gingerly in the small trough with his knees up to his chest and began to wash vigorously. He used an empty can to scoop water onto his stringy hair, and then followed that with plenty of soap. Water spilled and splashed, but soon enough the man was finished. Man, oh man, that feels good. I have not had a warm bath in almost a month. When he stood, the girl saw his full body for the first time. His thing was different from the beast, not bigger or smaller, but cleaner looking. She hoped it would not hurt her when he stuck it in her. He had said he would not hurt her, but she expected him to lie like the beast had. He dried himself quickly and found new clothing for himself from the pile. He then piled the rest into the other corner of the cellar and told the girl to crawl under for warmth. He poured the dirty water into pails and carried it up and out to be disposed of. Back in the cellar, the man looked at the girl and asked, Did you find shoes and socks in the clothing? She nodded quickly. Good, if you have to take a leaker shit, do you think you can make it upstairs by yourself? The girl thought about it for a bit. She did not even remember what was up the stairs as it had been dark when she was first brought here. She hesitantly shook her head. The man sighed. Well, do you have to do either now? The girl nodded. Piss or shit? The girl nodded, then shook her head. Okay, well that's easy. He grabbed an old dirty piece of paper towel from the beast's hoard and reached his hand down to her. Let's go, girl, I'll help you up there. The girl timidly took the tall man's hand and he pulled her upright. She swayed a bit, as this was the first time she had stood in weeks. You gonna make it? She nodded. Dog, let's go, he said sharply, causing the big dog to wake up and head to the door. Together with the big black dog leading the way, they made it through the hatch and up the narrow stairs. At the top, the girl was confused as she saw the cleared paths in the snow leading out from the remains of the house the cellar was under. The man quickly led her to a back corner of the standing garage where the beast had done his business and dumped her waste. There was a long mound of frozen urine and shit. Quickly, the girl undid her oversized trousers and pulled down the oversized man's underwear she had been wearing. She held the tall man's hand for balance as she squatted over the pile and urinated. 
When she was finished, the man grabbed her by the scruff of her neck with one hand and handed her the paper with his other. She wiped herself as best she could with her one good hand. When the girl was finished, she waited by the doorway to the collapsed house while the man took a leak himself. She saw up in the rafters were hung plastic bags that were red and full of frozen meat from the beast. As they moved to return into the house and down to the cellar, the girl paused a moment to look out a broken window. It was an overcast day with no sign of the sun and there was deep snow covering the former dry desert landscape. She just stared at the alien scene that was so different from the southern Utah she had grown up in. The man helped her down the stairs and after calling the dog in, sealed the hatch shut. He handed her another cup of melted water. It'll be dark soon, take a drink and get to bed. The girl sipped the water and moved to burrow herself into the new pile of clothing. She was surprised when the man tossed the old smelly quilt the beast had used on top of her. He then crawled under the pile behind her and wrapped his arm around her. The big dog circled around at her feet and tucked itself into the pile also. She was scared and confused by the man's actions, but loved the warmth. She laid there waiting for him to take her, but soon she heard his breathing slow as he fell asleep. The girl lay awake, puzzled, until eventually the warmth and comfort she felt grew to be too much and she too drifted off. The next few weeks were more of the same. They would wake and share a meal. Then, the tall man prepared for his daily scouting trips outside for food and fuel each day. When he returned, frozen and wet, he would get a good fire going and they would cook a second early supper. Every four or five days, he would bring in enough water to have an evening bath. It was during the third such bathing session when the girl noticed the tall man staring at her naked body a bit longer than normal. He brought her another pan of warm water, and as he did, she noticed his penis beginning to thicken. Without much thought, she reached out with her good hand and pulled him closer and took him into her mouth. The man looked shocked, but also let out a long moan. He did not pull away and after a minute of her oral actions, started to thrust his hips using her mouth harder. Soon the man stiffened and filled her mouth with his spend. She quickly swallowed, knowing she would be beaten if she gagged or spit it out. When she was done, the man just gave her a sad look and moved away to let her finish her bath. That night, as they lay in the pile of clothing, the man hugged her tight for a minute before falling asleep. She felt... She did not understand what she felt, but she was happy the beast was gone for good. You know, I won't hurt you if you speak, girl. At least tell me your name. He whispered behind her. She thought about it for only a second before barely shaking her head. No. Suit yourself. I hope you will come to trust me someday. The next morning, sometime before dawn, she awoke to find the man rubbing her womanhood slowly with his big fingers. She hissed in shock before remembering the rule about noise. She then went quiet and rolled to her back, spreading her legs for him to take her. Instead, the man just kept rubbing her very gently. The girl was confused, wondering why he was waiting. After five minutes of the gentle rubbing, the girl suddenly realized her hips were slowly moving in time with his fingers. Also, there was a warm, wet feeling happening down deep in her core. She started breathing deeper. She clutched his arm with her good hand, urging him to move faster. As his speed increased and her feelings grew, she finally remembered what was happening to her. It had been so long since she had touched herself in pleasure way back when the world had been normal. This felt different to have someone else touch her in a way that did not cause pain, but instead cause warmth. Oh! She gasped out as her core clenched and spasmed. She quickly covered her mouth with her hand and looked fearful. Instead of beating her, the man rolled her away from him and reached down and spread her ass cheeks carefully. The girl felt his hard shaft as he began to move it around near her opening, gathering her leaking moisture. Her eyes opened wide, not with pain, but surprised at the pleasure she felt as his member began to sink inside her depths. For the next five minutes, the man continued to slowly and gently penetrate her core. The girl was both confused and enraptured at the feelings the motion caused. They grew slick at their connection. As her breathing deepened, the man gently moved one of his hands down and began slowly rubbing her in small circles. Her hips started moving more forcefully, pushing both back against his shaft and forward against his fingers. Her breathing became quick pants. 
The man was breathing faster too along with his motions. As their pitch grew to a frantic slapping of their bodies, the girl gasped out and pulled his hand to her core with her own. Oh! The man slammed forward and stiffened and moaned out his own pleasure. He wrapped his arms around her as the tension slowly left them. The girl just lay there recovering from something that had never happened when the beast had had his way with her. Eventually, he released her and stood up. The girl watched him move about the cellar suddenly fearful, remembering the noise she had made. But he avoided her for some reason. After he had rummaged through the beast's food stash, he finally approached her. We are about out of food here and we've burned the easy wood above. I'll have to start tearing down the house to get more firewood soon. She glanced at the bag laying on the floor that had a bit of meat still left in it. Most of that had been going to the dog, but they had added some to their stew many times over the past week. The man squatted down next to her and looked her in the eye. I plan to leave this place today. I know of a place about eight miles to the northeast, up near the Virgin River Runs. There is a place where I think there might be some supplies. It was the home of a strange feller who kept to himself mostly and I think he has a bunker or something. He paused to think a bit before continuing. I want to take the little food there is left and head out for his place. You have a choice. You can either bundle up in as much clothing as you can and go with me or you can stay here. The man looked away and said quietly, I can leave you that man's pistol for, you know, if you want. For a long moment, the girl just lay there confused. She wondered if she wanted to continue on. She wondered if the tall man even wanted her to go with him. All she was sure of was that she wanted to get out of this place. She stood and went to the clothing pile and started pulling on extra pants and shirts. When both of them were fully dressed, they headed up the stairs following the black dog. As always, it was overcast. It was not snowing and the winds were mild, which were both abnormal but welcomed. They spent all morning trudging through the snow, heading northwest around what the man called Gooseberry Mesa. After a lunch of cooked and salted meat, the pair continued on, this time on a more easterly trek. It had begun snowing again, and they were both tired and cold. The man had to pause many times waiting for the girl to catch up. We are almost there, girl. Just down that valley ahead and across the Virgin River. The girl was too cold to even shiver, but kept on trudging down the snowy slope. The river was frozen, and they were able to cross without incident. That's the place I was talking about, the man said, pointing to a small group of structures about half a mile ahead. It looks like only one of the buildings there is burned. We're in luck. Just then, the big black dog started growling, looking off to the west along the frozen river. The man pulled out his shotgun and positioned himself in front of the girl. From around a bend in the river, a pack of wild dogs came running towards them. The man's black dog ran ahead and met the lead wild dog head on. The pair began rolling around in the snow with the black dog finally getting his jaws around the neck of the wild dog. The rest of the pack split between the fighting pair of dogs and the man and the girl. The black dog was soon being harassed by two other wild dogs and was forced to release its hold on the first dog. Boom, 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 the man fired as fast as he could aim. Three dogs were down, two howling and yelping and biting at the wounds in their hindquarters. He quickly reloaded new shells into the magazine and swiveled around to take aim at the dogs trying to circle them. Boom, he got off one more shot as two dogs jumped at him taking him down. The shotgun went flying. The big man struggled with the dogs trying to protect his throat with one arm while desperately trying to retrieve his pistol with his other. The girl dove to where the shotgun had landed and struggled to bring it up with her good left hand. Crack! 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 The man managed to fire off three quick shots at the dogs on him. He hit one of the dogs and it fell back with a yelp. Blood was pouring from the man's neck. Crack! Crack! He fired twice more wounding the second dog and sending it crawling away. Two more dogs approached. These were all that remained of the dog fight, as both the man's black dog and the first of the wild dogs were down and not moving. Crack! One of the dogs yelped as the man's pistol shot took it in the chest as it jumped it. The second dog took the man down again causing him to drop the pistol. The last dog tore and worried at the man's throat as he struggled to fight back with just his bare hands. The girl just watched in horror as the man finally passed out from blood loss 
and stopped struggling. The dog continued worrying the man's neck before releasing his now still body. It turned and faced the girl, bloody teeth bared stalking closer to her. She tried with all her might to raise the heavy shotgun with just her left hand. Boom. She managed to fire the shotgun but missed. Worse, the recoil had launched the shotgun from her grasp, stinging her good hand in the process. The last dog jumped. She instinctively threw up her mangled wrist to protect her throat, which allowed the wild dog to bite hard into her damaged arm. She fell backwards, pulling the dog on top of her. It shook her hard, her arm still in its jaws. Her flailing, free left hand landed on something hard, and she realized it was the pistol. She blindly groped for its handle and managed to get her hand on the grip. Crack. She got off one shot into the wild dog's chest, but also dropped the pistol in the process. She felt the warm blood of the dog soaking her front as its grip on her wrist slowly released. After a few seconds, the girl managed to push the heavy dog off of her and got to her feet. She cradled her torn and bleeding forearm and looked over the scene of carnage. Some of the dog still whimpered, and one was still dragging itself away. The man was gone. He laid there silent and still, his eyes open and bloody throat exposed to the cold, seeing that she choked out a sob. She fell to her knees beside him and buried her face into his chest. She continued to shake with grief for a moment before the pain in her arm made itself known. She inspected her wrist and the flowing blood and knew she had to stop the bleeding. Removing the man's belt one-handed was hard. Getting it tightly triple-wrapped around her right arm near the elbow was even harder. Eventually, she managed to tug the belt tight and get it hooked. The bleeding had slowed drastically, so she tucked her useless right arm into her loose, oversized coat. She grabbed the water container from the man and what was left of their food and went to look for the pistol. She found that and then spun around looking for the structures the man had been pointing at. If she could find shelter, she would be able to return here for the dog carcasses later. She ran stumbling towards the compound. It had been surrounded by a fence, but there were many openings and down sections now. <coughs> she reached the house and looked into one of the broken windows. It was completely empty. No furniture, no garbage or food cans, nothing. She circled the house, but each window revealed the same. Someone had beaten her here. At the garage, she noticed the side door was open. She cautiously entered and found it empty as well. It had had a door into the house, but that door was open. The one curious thing was that the garage interior was spotlessly clean. No car, but no debris or bones or anything. She shut the side door of the garage behind her and began to inspect the small attached house. The kitchen cupboard doors were all open, but they were as empty as the rest of the house. It must have been vacant when the end came, she thought. She continued her search and soon confirmed that every single room was bare. There was no cellar or signs of stairs or even of a hidden hatch. The faucets and toilet were bone dry. The girl found a small room without windows and sat on the floor. She had the pistol and a bit of waiter and food. Should she try to stake out somewhere else or try to stay here? As she thought, she noticed the throbbing and her arm getting worse, so she pulled the arm out of her jacket to inspect it. It was ruined with her wrist a mass of torn flesh and exposed bones. Sadly, she realized that she would not survive the wound with it like this. She'd need to go retrieve the man's knife and enough fuel to get a fire going. She would then have to cut her arm off near her wrist and stick the stump into the fire. Even if she managed to do that, there was a slim chance she would survive. Why even bother? She bowed her head and looked at the pistol. In all the months she had been the beast's toy, the girl had been unable to run away or escape by taking her own life. Then, when the new man had rescued her and shown her a bit of kindness, he was taken by the dogs. Now, the girl sat in an empty house with no food or heat and wondered what the point of struggling any longer was. Her adrenaline had finally burned down and her eyes had closed when she heard the noise. It was coming from the garage and the girl became quiet and retreated back into the corner of the closet. The noise had sounded like a machine or an elevator. What could it be, she wondered. Was it a new beast to come put her in chains again? She waited with the pistol, too scared to even shiver. 
The noise grew quiet and was replaced with a faint shuffling. The new noise was coming closer to the girl and she finally began to tremble. Just outside the closet, the girl had chosen to hide and a voice sounded. Please set the firearm down in front of you. The girl's eyes opened at the voice. It had been that of a woman, but it sounded off, like a machine or something. She refused to lower the pistol and instead leaned slowly towards the doorway to peek around and see who had spoken. As her dirty face came around the corner of the doorframe, the waiting mobile unit activated its electrical nerve disruption device. This caused the girl to seize up and tumble forward. The mobile unit then quickly approached and extended a mechanical arm, administering a sedative directly into the girl's neck. The girl's last view as she slipped into unconsciousness was that of the garage floor as she was dragged over to a brightly lit hatch in the floor. She never felt the sensations of descending the lift shaft or of being lifted and deposited into the medical creche. After having stripped the girl of her clothing and spraying her damaged arm with a foaming conjuring agent, the machine caused the creche lid to close. The artificial intelligence in charge of the Utah field base reviewed the memories of the girl while it prepared her for full biosuspension. Although not human and not subject to the limitations of human emotions, the intelligence was still advanced and intuitive enough to recognize the point at which the young woman's past existence had changed from one of happiness to one of tortured pain and suffering. It then reformatted the small human's memories, deleting everything from the moment the planetary changing events began up to the current time. The machine would deal with the girl's confusion when she was eventually woken in the future. The girl slept on and would continue to do so peacefully for millennia. 3rd 16th, 2932, 910 years later. The tall, physically fit woman exited the underground facility's lift shaft, along with her much shorter, dark gray android companion. They were each carrying an end of a large, heavy suitcase-sized data storage module. Walking backwards easily, the android led the way down the long access corridor heading for the landing pad of the field base, located in the southern end of an area once known as the political state of Utah. When will we know if the mine data can be reconstructed? The bronze-skinned woman asked her machine companion. Not until the memory unit has been physically delivered to the space station. It will take the greater processing power of the main AI presence there to extrapolate and fill in any overwritten or degraded memory segments. Together, they got the bulky memory module installed into the belly storage bay of the flyer. When that was done, the woman looked around the beautiful but desolate landscape surrounding them. The location was so much drier than the area where she had grown up, and as always, the unfamiliar distant mountains intrigued her. She decided to delay her return in the flyer for a short time. I feel like taking a hike, Omu. Do you want to come along and keep me company? No, Oxy. If it is permissible, I would stay and recharge my power cells. There are no dangerous animals within the monitoring range of the perimeter sentinels, and I will follow your trek with an aerial drone overwatch. The short android replied. Sonic. All right, you stay. If my husband should call needing pickup earlier than anticipated, let him know that I will be back in an hour or so. Or come get me if it's urgent, she said. Affirmative, her android friend replied. As Uxie hiked through the rocky outcroppings and sparse high desert scrub, she thought about today's side mission. The AI had concurred with her and her husband John's assessment that the mentally edited Ukrainian girl's development was not progressing well. They hoped to restore her sense of self and balance by reintroducing the almost completely deranged woman to her erased memories. The dilemma was how to do that without traumatizing the girl even further and causing additional damage. It would require a delicate touch and would have to be done slowly and patiently. From what the AI had been able to confirm about her original past, she had suffered as greatly in the distant past as she had more recently. And the recent numerous attempts to patch the woman's psyche had only made things worse. Fortunately, they had someone available who had many lifetimes of experience in caring for those who had mental limitations and disabilities. That person might tip the balance and help ease this poor girl along to a suitable recovery. When she returned, Uxy took her place next to the small android in the cockpit of the craft named Hoss. Up they went, 
using the overpowered aircraft to quickly fly to one of the three nearby template colony sites, where her husband John was currently engaged in dialogue with the new population living there. John had continued with their primary mission and main reason for coming back to the Earth and had seen some success. It had been a mission to recruit much needed assistance. They had spent the bulk of the last five years working in lunar orbit, designing and building humanity's first interstellar starship. John and Uxie had been the sole humans working with the machines during those early years. Now they needed others to supplement the AI machines so they had returned on a recruiting drive. For the past month and a half, in addition to a bit of rest and relaxation in the normal Earth gravity, they had traveled around the world visiting various colony sites. In that time, they found 60 volunteers. Clones of Manuel Rodriguez had been the most numerous in agreeing to migrate, with 35 copies of the man, originally from Central America, volunteering to help their cause. Clones of the female Ella Williams, originally from Australia had provided another dozen worker candidates. The rest had come from a random few of the duplicates of the other seven humans. For the female clones, their current pregnancy state had much to do with their decision on whether to volunteer or not. Understandably, those heavy with child were the least likely to commit to an extended trip to Luna. There were a few exceptions to that, however. Two clones of the Romanian woman, Irina Ioveanu, had requested an immediate cesarean to remove their late-term fetuses in order to be medically able to relocate and work in a low-G environment. Their fellow colony members agreed to care for the babies after the fetuses had finished maturing inside the specialized medical creches into which they'd been placed. Uxie found it odd that only three of her husband's clones had volunteered. Although the clones had all been mentally adjusted so that there were clear differences from John Prime, it was almost as if John's clones were embarrassed or uncomfortable to be around him. Uxi had also detected a similar hesitancy or discomfort from her husband when he was physically near his clones. She was curious about John's feelings on his clones, but had decided to not press the issue now. It had been on the recruiting tour that something had occurred which caused today's diversion. While they had been visiting the colonies located in old Europe and Western Asia, an incident had occurred at the template colony in the Ukraine. Being close by, her husband's assistance to mediate the matter had been requested. At the colony which had been created near the old city of Venezia, there had been an attempted murder. The victim had been the clone of the male, Li Qiang. Uxie had always had a bad feeling about the man and had not been completely surprised to learn that he had been attacked. His attacker was the local clone of Hannah Crather. Hannah had been a young girl who had once lived in her husband's home country, a place that had once been known as the United States. Uxie had always felt great sympathy towards the Hannah line. The original Hannah had been placed in suspension by the enemy long after its attack had begun. Hannah had survived the apocalypse for over a year. In that time, she had been kidnapped, regularly raped, nearly starved, and nearly crippled. Very near her death, she had stumbled upon an alien compound by chance. The controlling AI there, instead of exterminating her, had decided to place her into long-term biosuspension for possible later use. As it did so, it had healed the girl's physical injuries it had also scanned the girl's memories and discovered the trauma and hardship she had undergone. To simplify any future mental conditioning, the machine decided to wipe most of Hannah's memories before storing her away. When it had awoken the girl nine centuries later and cloned her to be spread among the template colonies, her altered mental state persisted and caused issues with her new companions. The issues and clear signs of self-abuse had been apparent early on when Uxie and John had first encountered her and her clones during their first colony visits. Over half of the Hannah clones were immediately removed from their colonies. These had undergone further mental conditioning in an attempt to remove the more recent trauma. They also had had their physical bodies de-aged to that of a young teenager. Finally, these clones had been placed into the colony's centralized boarding schools where they were to live with the other children in an attempt to give them a new foundation. 
This group of Hannah clones were almost a decade older than the other children in the schools, so they had become something like big sisters. The teaching androids had also utilized the more mature Hannah clones to act as student teachers. The results had been good for both the Hannahs and the younger children. The project was still ongoing, but looked to be successful, with the Hannah clones displaying almost no signs of their original issues. Not all of the original template colony Hannah clones were able to join in this reversion therapy experiment, however. Due to various stages of pregnancies and the fact that Naomi, John's AI, had wanted an unmodified control group, over a dozen Hannahs had remained in the colonies and left as they were. One of those had been the Hannah who had lived in the Venitsia, Ukraine colony. Something had caused Hannah Venitsia to snap. She had finally had enough of her male partner Li Chang's abuses and cruelty. After suffering through a rather brutal night of torment and unwanted intercourse, she had taken a rock and bashed the sleeping Li Chang in the head. Due to the available medical treatments, the man had survived, but the event was too much for the monitoring AI to ignore. All of the remaining unaltered clones in the control group were immediately isolated from their template colonies. If they had been pregnant, the fetuses were removed and placed into uterine replicators to continue to mature. The Hannah clones were then placed into biosuspension to begin the memory alterations and de-aging like the earlier group had undergone and which had shown some success. The Venitia clone was not placed in suspension, however. Her fellow colony members were torn over what the woman's fate should be. Some had wanted her removed and treated like the other clones around the world, while others wanted her punished because of her murder attempt. When they learned that John Prime was in the area, they petitioned for him to come and break the impasse. When he had arrived and investigated the matter, John Prime had uncovered the truth of the woman's abuse by her partner, Lee Kyung. With those full details now brought into the light, he had used his influence to act. First, he caused the entire Li Qiang line to undergo mental adjustments to mitigate their crueler tendencies and lower their overall aggression levels. Next, John Prime ruled that Hannah Crather Venitia had acted in self-defense and would not be punished. Finally, he had her removed from the colony and sent to the nearby field base to undergo further treatment. Instead of treating Hannah Venitia like the other clones had previously been treated, by further mental redactions and de-aging, Naomi pushed to try something new. An alternative treatment that was risky, but if successful would replace the mishmash personality constructed of artificially repressed memories and added fabrications in the current clone with something closer to the personality once possessed by the original girl from Utah. When asked about the treatment, Hannah Venitia had quickly agreed. In fact, she'd agreed so quickly that the AI had to utilize both John and Ux to determine if the damaged girl was competent enough to decide on her own treatment. They had found that she was, barely, and the treatment was to proceed. Naomi's new plan was that, instead of further mental manipulation of this Hannah's already damaged psyche, the clone would be reverted completely back to her original state. The AI had recommended that her mind data be completely wiped and replaced with a full copy of an earlier version of the girl. That treatment plan was why Uxi and Omu had been exploring the deep archives of the old Utah field base. They had been searching for and had found a copy of the woman's original mental state, which had been taken over nine centuries ago. The copy had still existed in the archives of the original field base, where the original Hannah had once undergone biosuspension. Uxi and Omu had retrieved that memory archive and were now carrying it with them aboard Haas, flying to meet up with her husband still on his recruiting mission at the nearby template colony site. After they picked him up, they would fly a short two hours northwest to a large lake in the western part of the former state of Nevada. There they would dock with their orbit-capable space launch vehicle Bucephalus, which currently waited there having replenished its hydrogen fuel from the waters of the lake. Then they would launch and make their way to the orbiting space station they'd recently named High Castle where the delicate work of recovering the memory module's contents would begin. July 23rd, 2932, 10 weeks later. The woman came awake drenched in sweat. It had been the nightmare with the wild dogs this time. She reached over to the small table next to her bed 
and touched the base of the small lamp. It slowly began to glow, growing brighter. Agent Time, the woman breathed. As always, speaking, even whispering came hard to her. Sometimes she could not bring herself to utter thoughts aloud and simply remained silent. Doing that too often here was not tolerated though, but luckily she found that addressing the machine was easier for some reason. It is Euro 323, Hannah. Did you have another traumatic dream? The feminine sounding synthetic voice asked in reply. Yes, she replied, sounding both sad and frustrated. Would you like me to summon Mother Branco? The machine asked cheerily. No, please let her sleep. I'm fine. I'll be all right, the woman said softly. As you wish, Hannah. Know that the compound is secure and that you are safe. Please try to continue your sleep period as best you can, the machine said. She fluffed her pillow and rolled over after having set the lighting to partially on. As she lay there, the woman thought back to the past week and how she had come to be at this place, deep in the jungles of South America. Everything was vague and dreamlike. Her memories were in turmoil. Hannah sat next to Mother Branco on a rough woven mat in the shaded area that was the covered entry of their combined dwelling and medical treatment center. She sipped her morning tea and enjoyed the quiet routine of greeting the new day as they had for the past four days. They seldom spoke during this contemplative time as they took in the wakening community and the rainforest beyond. As she sat there, she occasionally glanced at the gray-haired matriarch sitting next to her. The agent AI voice referred to the woman as Abby, and she had sometimes heard the villagers call her Dusa. The old woman would scowl if she overheard the use of the term, so Hannah suspected the name was a derogation of some sort. What made her unsure was that the villagers were usually kneeling before the old woman when they muttered it. Hannah had been instructed to call the old woman Mother Branco and had been treated well by the woman since she had arrived. The old woman remained calm and patient with the clearly troubled younger woman and had quickly earned her trust. To her relief, Hannah found that she was able to begin answering Mother Branco's gentle probing questions only hours after they had met. Over the next three days, she became more comfortable with both her caregiver and her new surroundings. The days had been mostly tranquil but had ended with a few hours of discussion after each evening meal. Then she would lie in her small private room and reflect upon the sessions and her recovering memories. The older woman led the topics of their nightly conversations and instead of questioning or instructing Hannah, she settled the younger woman by telling stories of her own long life and experiences. Hannah was fascinated enough that she found herself asking questions despite her hesitancy to talk. The older woman carefully answered each before continuing on with her history. It was not until weeks later that Hannah realized that the lack of any early questions directed towards her had really been because the younger woman hadn't yet had many memories implanted. That began to change as the daily medical creche sessions added more and more of her old mind data to her current body. Today looked to be another day like the previous. She had awakened, broken her fast, and joined the older woman out on the terrace. Finally, their hour-long morning contemplation ritual came to an end with Mother Branco simply saying, Hannah, it is time for work. The work the old crone referred to was seeing to the medical needs of the tribe who lived in the area. In these duties, Hannah acted as her assistant. For a few hours in the morning, the work took place in the same building she was currently residing in, as the front entry portion of the structure contained a fully equipped, automatic medical treatment center. Hannah's primary duties were one of comfort, soothing the fears and nerves of the primitive humans about the strange machines and devices used to treat them. Later in the day, after a simple noon meal, the pair would travel out of the main camp and do medical rounds in the nearby villages. A fully laden pack mule-like mobile unit followed them carrying basic medical gear. If all went well, they would return to the main compound by late afternoon. Mother Branco would then nap for a few hours after first seeing the younger woman into the medical creche for an hour of memory work. Hannah would awaken just before their supper meal. Her body would be refreshed, but her mind would feel sluggish and confused from the newly implanted memories. What was worse is that she would not yet properly remember them. It would take a full night's sleep before the new information could be properly integrated into her consciousness. Until then, 
The memories would exist in the background, a fog of imaginings and vague recollections which she was not able to trust as her own. After supper, the pair would reconvene indoors for their nightly talk. There, away from the curious eyes of the nearby tribal humans and free from the evening swarms of insects, Mother Branco would hold more intimate therapy sessions. These were focused on Hannah's newer memories and how she was adjusting to them. Hannah, I know you have been having bad dreams for the past week. They are the result of the machine's daily treatments. Do you remember what it is doing? The older woman asked. Struggling to speak, Hannah answered, I think, I think I can remember more of my life back when I was a girl. I think it's doing something to my memory. That is correct. You have suffered terrible hardships, Hannah. Both in the distant past, and some much more recently, after you were awakened in this new world. Do you remember what I told you last night? The older woman asked. Yes. You said that I have lived two separate lives. That I lived my first life a long, long time ago. Back in the early part of the 21st century. Yes, Hannah, that is correct. You were born in the year 2005, over 925 years ago. You grew up in a place called Utah, on a continent far to the north of this one. When you were a teenager, our enemy began its extermination campaign against all mankind, wrecking much of the world in the process. Do you still understand this? Yes. Mother Branco, I understand. I don't remember it clearly, though, the younger woman stammered. That's okay, dear. Unfortunately, you will remember everything all too clearly soon. As I was saying, you suffered greatly during those events and almost died. But the enemy found you and put you to sleep for over nine centuries. In doing so, it erased some of your memories, the old women explained patiently. Why? Why would it do that? Hannah asked with emotion. Strangely, it was attempting to spare you, child. As I said, you had suffered greatly suffered more than any person should ever suffer. The enemy machine tried to erase your memories of that suffering. It was worried that the grief would cause you to lose your mind. The pair paused while a mobile unit brought them tea. When they had been served, Mother Branco continued. Then, in the year 2919, 11 years ago, you were awakened into this new age from your long slumber. The machine made 47 copies of you and spread them around the world. You... I don't remember any of that, Hannah sobbed, interrupting Mother Branco. Nothing. Mother Branco leaned over and hugged the crying woman tightly for a moment. Yes, as I have said, all of your recent memories have been erased. This treatment began five days ago. Was... was it the enemy machine again? Hannah managed to stammer out. No, child. This time your memory was erased with your own consent. You allowed it to be done because you were having trouble living in this new world. It's a long story, but I will do my best to explain. The explanation went on for the next 40 minutes. The younger woman learned details about how she had been created, grown actually, as a clone of the original Hannah Crather. Her new home had been in the old country of Ukraine, near the old city of Vinitsia, where her template colony had been established. That was why her full name was now Hannah Crather Vinitsia. It was to differentiate her from the 46 other versions of her alive and living around the world. The Ukrainian colony had had three sections named A, B, and C, with Hannah having lived in C camp. She'd been part of a trinary union with two others, another woman named Luisa Perez, who'd originally lived nine centuries ago in Mexico, and a male, Li Kiang, who had originally been from a place called China. Her two partners had been clones like her, copied from the original stored humans. Like her, they had also been altered mentally, although with far fewer of their memories erased. They had also had their thoughts adjusted to help them accept each other and to live comfortably in their new surroundings. The memory alterations and adjustments resulted in the current clones having personalities which differed greatly from those of the original humans. With less extensive memory deletions than Hannah had undergone, Luisa and Li Kiang were far more normal. Hannah had not been so lucky and from early on had suffered mental issues. The other two humans had learned early on to watch over their adult companion, but not all had gone well. 
To make matters worse, her male companion Li Cheng had been changed for the worse by his mental alterations. He had ended up more aggressive, domineering, and cruel, with little compassion or empathy. He had treated both his female companions poorly, but Hannah had suffered the most, even being beaten senseless many times. Four of the Hannah clones had been driven to suicide over the first six years of the template colony's existence. This had occurred before John Abrams had taken control of the Earth from the enemy and discovered and freed the cloned humans. Six others in that same time period had caused injury or death to their own children. The enemy AI had tried to treat the damaged Hannahs, but had only suppressed, not cured, the underlying issues. After John and Uxie began visiting the colonies, they had quickly discovered the defective Hannahs and forced rapid changes. Most of the Hannahs had been removed from the company of Louisa and Li Qiang and undergone extensive memory erasures, removing much of the recent decade. Their bodies had been altered along with their minds, being de-aged to be much younger in appearance and had been placed into the communal schools to live with the colony's other children. The thought was that by giving those Hannahs a new childhood that they would develop in a more normal and healthy manner. It was apparently working with the bulk those clones now stable and happy. Mother Branco had told Hannah that for various reasons, not all of the clones had undergone treatment. She had been a part of that group. Then, recently she had become violent and tried to murder one of her partners. A more drastic treatment would be needed for her. That drastic treatment was why Hannah Venezia was here now with Mother Branco. Mother Branco smiled down upon the woman as she lay in the treatment basin of the facility's medical crash. The younger woman smiled back, but it was clear that Hannah was nervous and scared. Child, today, the machine will restore the full and final memories of your youth. The treatment will last much longer this time. When you awaken, you will fully remember your childhood and your family. The older woman paused and frowned slightly. You will also remember them dying in front of you and the cruelty you suffered afterwards. It will be horrible, and the pain and sorrow will feel almost overwhelming to you. I wish I could spare you this fate, but it is important you know your own past. Mother Branco stood up slightly and her expression firmed. But you must remember this. You survived it all and lived. You are now well beyond those terrible times. You are free from them and they can no longer harm you. Cling tightly to those thoughts when you wake up. That knowledge may prevent the rediscovered memories of your past from overwhelming you. Do not forget this, child. Understand? The woman in the basin nodded. Her expression was one of nervousness, but also looked determined. I survived. I am beyond my past, she muttered as the lid began closing. Mother Branco nodded and stepped back from the medical machinery. The cover on the crash sealed and the woman inside drifted off to sleep as the sedatives took effect. She would remain in the treatment basin for the next four days, as her early memories were fully restored. During that time, the machine would bring her to partial consciousness many times, letting her brain and psyche fully absorb the memories. If all went as planned, the knowledge that she had survived her suffering and lived beyond those harsh times would see her pass the worst of the memories. The old woman scowled as she moved to get ready for her own slumber. This treatment the machine had come up with was so risky, so much could still go wrong. Three weeks later, the woman came awake drenched in sweat. The night had been filled with the usual nightmares. Seeing her mom and dad killed in front of her, constant hunger, wild dogs attacking, feeling that horrible man, the beast, on top of her, violating her over and over. As before during the worst of the dreams, she heard the old woman's voice. You have survived this child. It happened almost a thousand years ago. The reminder helped and allowed her some peace and a bit of reassurance. She'd stopped waking up from the nightmares and instead trained her subconscious to shift the nightmares to more pleasant dreams, or even better, restful sleep. The troubled woman sat on the shaded porch with her ancient caregiver companion and watched the nearby village come alive with the advancing morning. Mother Branco remained silent, knowing that the younger woman preferred not to speak. She was surprised when the younger woman did so. I had been pregnant. 
The older woman did not immediately respond to the younger woman's statement. Finally, after noticing the child looking at her questioningly, Mother Branco responded, Yes. You remember noticing the changes your body had undergone. Once your rescuer allowed you access to more food, the pregnancy would have advanced quickly. It is still surprising that because of your near starvation, the fetus had not been spontaneously aborted. The younger woman remained silent after Mother Branco's confirmation and explanation. The old woman was unsure of whether her charge was just mulling over her reply or suffering from another flashback to her torture and confinement so long ago. She noticed the younger woman unconsciously rubbing her right wrist, which confirmed that it was likely the latter. The bad times are over, Hannah. They are just memories. There is now abundant food and you are safe, Mother Branco reaffirmed quietly. The younger woman took a deep breath, regaining some sense of her current condition and surroundings. Finally, she looked at the older woman. The, the baby was aborted, she whispered finally. Ah, yes, the machine had explained to Mother Branco about the girl's upbringing. A certain religion had been strong in the area of the girl's upbringing, and she had grown up under its teachings. Mm. Hannah, I know little of the teachings of the faith you were raised with. However, the machines have taught me some of its tenets. One of these was that abortion was not completely forbidden if the pregnancy was the result of rape. Abortion was also permitted if the pregnancy would have caused harm to the mother. Both cases were true with you, child. Also, never forget that you were denied any choice in the matter. The troubled girl remained silent for the remainder of their morning quiet time. The older woman noticed that she seemed to be more at peace as they went about the work of the day. That evening, after the evening meal, the two sat and talked. I had more babies in the time after I was cloned and awakened. Yes, Hannah, during your time in the template colony, you bore seven children, two sons and five daughters, Mother Branco explained. I do not remember them, Hannah said sadly. The children are being cared for? Yes, child, the old woman said, smiling. Louisa and Li Chang care for the youngest while the older children live in the communal schools. They do come home to your former partners every few weeks for a long weekend. They are all thriving. Will my memories of them and this time be returned to me? The younger woman finally asked. Not your actual memories, no. But you will be permitted to learn about your recent life if you wish through the camp's recordings, the older woman explained. Seeing the younger woman's troubled look, she went on. Hannah, the machine had altered and erased so much of your memories before you were taken to the template colony. That person was not you. She was just a damaged, fabricated shell of a human being and shared little of your memories and personality. Having those memories returned to you, no, would cause far more harm than good. September 24, 2932. Five weeks passed. The younger woman continued to suffer from nightmares occasionally, but their frequency and intensity had lessened. Her days were routine. The quiet morning contemplation hours separated from the nightly therapy session by five or six hours of assisting the older woman as she went about her tribal medical duties. That routine was shattered one morning when, after the contemplation hour, the old woman took Hannah to the main treatment building. Instead of working with the medical needs of the tribe, this day there was a new man standing by the treatment basin. He looked unlike the typical tribal males she had helped treat over the past few months. Something about his appearance made the younger woman uneasy. Hannah, do you know this person? Mother Branco asked. The man stood there impassively in the presence of the two women, and Hannah wondered if he had been drugged. She studied the man noting that he was taller than the typical tribal males. His body looked leaner and had a strange tightness at the corners of his eyes. His hair was slightly browner than the common black of the tribe. No, who is he? She asked. This is one of Li Chiang's clones, Mother Branco explained. Hannah knew the name. It was the name of one of the other eight humans who, like her, had been preserved by the enemy and later used to create the template colonies. Li Chiang had also been the male in the group Hannah had lived with, the older woman continued. Specifically, this Li Chiang is from the Venezia colony, just like you. Hannah paused in her examination of the male. 
So this had been her actual partner and had been the man she had apparently tried to kill. She examined her emotions deeply, but could find neither hatred nor loathing for the man. She also did not fear him, although maybe she did feel a sense of unease about him. She cautiously stepped closer and noted the man continued to stare past her, not seeming to notice her at all. What's wrong with him? Did I damage him mentally when I attacked him? She asked quickly. He was fully healed from your attack and is currently undamaged. Due to his ongoing treatment and punishment, he is currently under the mental control of the machines. His higher mentality is being suppressed by an implant and the machine is controlling his gross responses, the old woman explained. Why is he here? Hannah asked. Among other things, he is here for you to have sex with, Mother Branco said casually. Visions of the thrusting beast working on top of her suddenly flooded her memories, causing her to stumble away from the man quickly. Her face took on a look of horror and panic. The older woman stepped between Hannah and Lee Kang. Hannah, Mother Branco said firmly, I said the machines have full control over him. He is harmless. The younger woman calmed but still retained the worried look. What? What if I don't want to have sex with him? She asked timidly. Then that would be a shame. He is quite good at it. Seeing the younger woman's shocked look towards her, Mother Branco chuckled. What? Someone had to test the machine's control of his body. And I will have you know that even these old bones still have needs. The older woman turned from her to again inspect the lean man standing in front of them. I have to admit it was better than I expected. Nothing robot-like, but I guess the machine did not have to direct the body much at all. It simply had to release enough control over the man for his body's natural instincts to take over. Still, enough control is maintained that he will remain quite gentle and will cause you no harm when you choose to partake of his skills. I will not. The old woman's cackling laughter interrupted Hannah's denial. You should remember, child, that you have lain with this man most nights for almost a dozen years. I've seen the records, and it was not all non-consensual. Your body enjoyed his talents even if your damaged mind was more hesitant. After a pause to allow the younger woman to ponder what had been said, Mother Branco continued, Also, consider that of the seven children you birthed, two were of this male's direct genetic line. Across all the template colonies, the pairing of your and his clones has resulted in 116 genetic offspring. Thus, Despite being less important now than in previous times, there are descendants who consider you and him to be their mother and father. The old woman reached up and stroked the passive male's chin. Finally, the Li Chang line has been changed. For better or worse, the machines have extensively messed with his mentality again. You will find that many of the traits that caused you such upset in the recent past have been reduced. Mother Branco turned from the lean male to study Hannah. This will be the final part of your treatment. Consider it the final test to determine if the changes made to you have been enough. But I don't... Silence, the old woman ordered. The forceful command had a strong effect on the younger woman, and the flashbacks to her original trauma caused Hannah to drop to her knees in supplication. Mother Branco approached and gently lifted Hannah's chin, forcing her to meet the elderly woman's gaze. Regardless of whether or not you use this male for sex, he will be your companion from now on. This will include both in your bedchamber and as you go about your day. You must learn to be among males again without fear. This is important for your recovery, Hannah. Do you understand? The younger woman returned Mother Branco's gaze for a long moment before she nodded that she did. The next morning, Hannah was exhausted. She had not slept a single moment of the previous night and instead sat curled in the corner watching her new companion sleep. As Mother Branco had promised, Li Kiang had not harmed her. In fact, he had ignored her after having been instructed to go to sleep. Despite this, the lingering demons from her past had caused her to toss and turn until she had given up trying to sleep. Mother Branco either ignored Hannah's tired appearance the next day or had simply not noticed. When their work was completed and the old woman had gone off to rest, Hannah collapsed on the table in the treatment room. She had been so tired that she had not realized that Lee King had remained in the room with her. 
When she was finally been awakened by Mother Branko for supper, Hannah noticed the passive male sitting in the corner. Their shared meal was quiet, the older woman naturally patient and the younger still tired. They both helped in preparing a plate for their subdued male companion and watched to see that his augment was able to guide his body through the motions of eating. The therapy session that night was a physical one with both women receiving gentle massages from the younger man. While not quite enjoying his touch, Hannah found that towards the end, she could tolerate physical contact with Lee Kyung without cringing away in fear. Mother Branko chuckled when Hannah's body betrayed her by emitting an unexpected groan of pleasure as he worked on her upper thighs and near her sex. Things continued to improve and progress with her male roommate. A few weeks later, the full extent of those improvements was brought out into the open by an unexpected comment from Mother Branko during their morning contemplative session. The machine reports that you have engaged in intercourse with Li Chang during each of the past three nights. Congratulations, child. Hannah could not quite prevent herself from spitting out a bit of her morning tea upon hearing the comment. The old woman caught her embarrassed reaction. What? Did you not realize that I received full reports on the progress of your recovery? The deep blush on the younger woman's face was answer enough. Hannah had not really expected that her slow progression towards full intimacy and fulfilling her bodily needs would be unnoticed, but she had never suspected that it would be the topic of the morning's conversation. Li Chang's mentality will remain under the full control of the machine for another two days. After that, there will be a gradual lessening of control. Your interactions with him will be of a more normal kind, although he will still be quite passive. No more abusing him like an immobile sex toy. Thankfully, nothing more was said, and they returned to the enjoyment of their tea in silence. Hannah found herself remembering the past few nights. The first night had been one of nervous experimentation, and had brought mostly relief that she could even touch the man in that way. She recalled laying there in the dark, fighting the urge to gratify her body's needs. Li Chiang lay on his mat nearby sleeping. As always, under the machine's control, he lay on his back, unmoving except for his steady breathing. She had watched him for any reaction as she began to quietly masturbate. As her body became flush with arousal, she stopped watching her companion and had closed her eyes, concentrating on her body's steadily approaching climax. When that pinnacle had been reached and her body had recovered from its all too brief spasms, she was shocked to find that Li Kang's body had responded to her actions with an erection clearly visible through his thin sleep covering. She had lain there frozen for a long moment, watching to see if Li Chang would make any moves towards her, but he remained as he was. Other than his erection, the only noticeable differences had been that he was breathing more deeply than normal, and that his nostrils seemed to be flaring occasionally. Hannah had realized that Li Qiang's erection was likely not due to some action of the controlling machine, but simply the man's body and subconscious responding naturally to the smell of her arousal. She had watched her partner for another five minutes without any change in his motionless state or any diminishment of his erection. Finally, she had hesitantly reached over and gently touched his chest. He remained still and unresponsive, so she had moved his sleep covering downward, fully espousing his torso and groin. His exposed penis had held her transfixed, and she was surprised to find her own body becoming further aroused. Was her own body remembering spending intimate moments with this man? Or was her mind remembering the betraying arousals her own body had felt during some of the times the beast had used her for his pleasure, back when she had been his captive? She had felt her sex fill with moisture. Emboldened, she gently grasped Li Chiang's penis and felt it throb in response. Her mouth also filled with moisture at the memories of being forced to service the beast orally. The momentary shame and guilt at that memory had caused her to release Li Chiang's penis, and she had returned to simply watching him in the darkness. Her groin was now pulsing with arousal, and she began imagining Li Chiang inside her. She realized that despite her recent memories of them being erased, her current body had borne many children. Its virginity had long since been removed, and she could easily take the man's penis inside her. She also recalled being used by the beast for almost a year, so there was no mystery about the mechanics of sex. 
She had remembered Mother Branco's words that intercourse would be required, and that she had survived much worse already. Deciding to give it a try, she timidly straddled the immobile torso of Li Qiang and inserted his erection into her sex. Despite her nervousness, her arousal and her body's experience allowed her to easily take his penis fully inside her. She had actually felt amazement at being so easily filled. After simply sitting in that position for a moment, her body had made its own needs known, and she had found herself moving on top of the man, grinding herself on him to reach her own climax. As her release neared, she had noticed that Li Chang's body was gasping in deep breaths. Although it remained frozen in the same position it had always been in, it was now straining and tense. Her orgasm had arrived just as she had felt his penis spasming inside her, and she had collapsed upon her partner with all nervousness forgotten. The next night she had not hesitated to repeat the previous encounter, and had even started before he had been allowed to sleep. This time she had to manually stimulate him into having an erection. When she mounted his erect penis, she had even been bold enough to order the AI to have him fondle her and help lift her by her hips. When he appeared to be reaching climax before her, she instructed the AI to delay his ejaculation until her orgasm. Hannah then recalled last night, she had lain there spread and waiting. The machine had been instructed to mount her very slowly and carefully and to immediately back off if she panicked. To her surprise, she had not recalled the beast as Li Kang's body thrust on top of her. No, she recalled the strong man who had slain the beast and rescued her. She had only been with the man for a few days before the wild dog pack had killed him, but in that time she had come to love him. It was sad that she had never learned his name, nor him hers. Names had been unneeded in that time of desperation. But that strong man was who she recalled as she gasped out her climax that night. Mother Branco spoke, bringing Hannah's thoughts back to the present. If you are worried you cannot become pregnant until the machine restores your menstrual cycle, I concurred with its reasoning that it would be best for you to not worry about possible pregnancies until you are fully recovered. With the progress you are making, I suspect that you will be permitted to make that choice for yourself soon enough," Mother Branco explained matter-of-factly. Hannah realized that the old woman had mistaken her deep contemplation of the past few nights as worrying about the potential consequences. She was surprised that the thought of becoming pregnant did not worry her in the least. Why exactly are you doing this, to the both of us?" Hannah meekly asked. Part of the answer is a question, do you wish to have more children? Hannah thought of the question. Did she want to have children? A warm feeling rose inside at the thought of holding tiny infants, of suckling them to her breast, or of rocking them to sleep. Yes, yes I do, she replied with growing confidence. Then that is the main reason why you are being pushed into being intimate with men. Although the machines are more than capable of impregnating you as often as you wish, that method would not suit who you are. You were brought up with a traditional mother and father. Even though that has less meaning in this age, having your future children fathered by men, even if genetically altered sperm is substituted, suits your makeup better. Mother Branco paused in her answer to give Hannah a chance to consider the statement. Hannah grudgingly admitted to herself that the older woman was right. When she dreamed of having babies, a man was always involved. Her deep sigh was taken as a sign of acquiescence. The other reason has less to do with you and more with Li Qiang. This is part of his punishment. No, not punishment, his rehabilitation, to use a better term. His mentality has been reconstructed. Intimacy with an equal is critical to his successful restoration as a potential mate. Hannah looked at the man, but as always, he simply sat passively as he had since their reintroduction. Could she interact with the man as his personality was allowed to express itself? What if he started actively pursuing her? Could she forget the trauma she had suffered under the beast so long ago? Come, let us put this aside for now and get busy with the work of the day, Mother Branco instructed. Three weeks later, Li Chiang was gone. Mother Branco explained that he had been rehabilitated enough to be sent off to live among normal humans. A mind data recording of this Li Chang had been taken and would be used to treat his fellow clones. 
There was hope that the entire line would be improved moving forward. Hannah was surprised to learn how much she missed the lean man. That her body missed his nightly presence was to be expected, as they were both fit and in their sexual prime. No, what surprised her was that her mind also missed his company. It was not so much their conversations as Lee Kyung had still been partially under the control of his augment. No, it was more that she missed caring for another and being cared for herself in return. She missed the companionship of an intimate partner. After allowing her a few days to get used to Lee Chang's absence, Mother Branko introduced her to a new companion. This time, it was a younger tribal male. Abby was warned that, although he was young and somewhat well-mannered, this young man was not under any control of the machines. She would have to navigate his natural male domination instincts and hormonal desires on her own. Mother Branco had given her one piece of advice. Control his rod, and you control him. Hannah first had thought this had been just humor, but soon found the wisdom in the advice. Using her feminine charms, she and the young male, Kawa was his name, had quickly reached an understanding. Apparently, thousands of generations of instinct had given her the tools and skills she needed to tame him as their relationship found its balance. Being young and eager meant that Kawa was also teachable. Unfortunately, his eagerness led to an aggressiveness that sometimes brought back memories of her rape and abuse. Hannah was surprised and pleased to learn that the fact that she had survived the early trauma helped her overcome her initial panic and revulsion she had felt with the young man. Her familiarity with her body's reactions and understanding its own needs helped also. She no longer felt the shame she had when her body had responded to her rape. Now she was able to meld the feelings and sensations with the joy the actions brought. And, as Kawan learned, he became more patient and less aggressive. Hannah learned to accept new pleasures with the youth, but also found that she missed something also. After two weeks and like Li Chang, Kawan was sent away. Mother Branko explained that Hannah had progressed far enough in her recovery that she no longer needed therapy. Tomorrow, Hannah would be leaving the Amazon preserve and be sent back to the outer world as a free woman. They spent their last evening in celebration and song. The older woman sang the tribal songs learned over her centuries of life in the village, while the younger woman shared the campfire songs of her youth. Hannah went to bed excited about the future, but also apprehensive about the safety she would be leaving behind. The next morning, their contemplative hour was interrupted by a bright red flyer landing in a nearby clearing. As the machine's engines wound down and stopped, a tall and fit man emerged from the right side canopy. It was John Prime and he was here to both visit his daughter, Mother Branco, and to take Hannah from this place. Hannah rose and helped Mother Branco to stand as well. When John Prime stepped on the terrace, he first gave the old woman a deep and long hug. Hannah remained apart to give them this father-daughter moment. After they separated, they stood for a moment just smiling at each other. Hannah noted both of them had shining eyes. How are you, Hannah? John Prime said to the young woman as he turned to her and offered his hand. Hannah tentatively took his. I'm... I'm fine, sir, she said with a blush. Your recent memory redactions mean you probably don't remember me or know who I am, John Prime said. I know you are John Prime, sir. Mother Branco has spoken of you, and I have watched the recordings from Venezia, from from when I tried to kill Li Chang. Hannah, please call me John. You and I shared too much history for you to call me sir. At Hannah's confused look, John clarified, not intimate history. What I mean is that with you now possessing the unaltered memories of the original Hannah, who grew up in Utah, you are the only other human being alive who fully remembers those long ago times. The other humans whom the master AI saved from that time, and including their clones, hell, even my fellow clones, have had their early memories tampered with. None of them remember the full true events like you and I, Hannah. In this way, we are unique and will always be kindred spirits. The three of them talked for the rest of the morning. Hannah was surprised to see John join her and Mother Branco as they treated those tribal members with urgent medical needs. When the medical work was done, they shared lunch, 
after which Mother Branco instructed Hannah to go speak with John Prime privately while she took a short nap. John and Hannah spoke of what the woman wanted to do with her life now that her treatment was over. John extended an offer to have Hannah travel with him and his wife back to space to join the other human workers at the lunar orbital construction yards. Hannah would learn what life was like in zero-g space yards and the low-g habitat. After learning the details, Hannah thought for a long moment. John, I'd like... I'd like to have children. Can I go with you to space and still do that? The young woman asked hesitantly. I'm sorry, Hannah. The null and low gravity environment is no place for the unborn or for growing babies or young children for that matter. Maybe someday after the underground lunar colony is constructed, the habitat there will be in a large gravity train with a simulated full Earth G for long-term habitation. Hannah found she wasn't too upset upon learning that. In fact, she just now realized exactly where she wanted to go. Then I'd like to stay on Earth if I may. I want to have children and help restore humanity, growing our numbers. Of course, Hannah, you can do that. Do you want to go back to the Ukraine, or do you have some other destination in mind? John Prime asked. Not the Ukraine. I have no memories of having lived there. No. I want to go home. To my real home in St. George, Utah. Three days later, Hannah sat on her new porch watching the morning sunrise above the arid plateau to the east. Her house was a small prefab dwelling unit, which the local manufactory had quickly thrown together to her specification and transported to this site by a heavy lift VTOL aircraft. It would do until she designed and supervised the construction of a more permanent home. She had selected the site for her prefab home to be southeast of the old town center, out in the desert scrub but near the meandering Virgin River. The nearest template colony branch was six miles to the north, close enough to visit easily by electric mule buggy, but far enough to give her privacy. The location was also a few miles from her family's original home site, so she had those familiar grounds to explore if she felt the need. Hannah spotted a doe deer as it drank by the river. She looked for more as the rising sun illuminated the scrub-lined waterway which meandered its way back to its source the distant mountains of an area that had been known as Zion National Park. That place was another of her former favorites, and she looked forward to Iking and exploring those amazing peaks and valleys once again. She rubbed her abdomen as she thought, and made her near future plans. It was incredible to think that she was already pregnant. Mother Branco had assisted with the implantation of the custom-designed embryo before they had left South America. The machines had an extensive DNA library to pull traits from, and in the end, she had chosen to have a male child based upon a blend of all its samples. She had wanted to ask John Prime to father her child, but had not had the courage. The man was clearly smitten with his wife, Uche Esperanza, and Hannah was not sure if they were allowing the use of his genetics for offspring by others. Besides, one of his clones lived in the nearby template colony, so it would still be possible to obtain genes from his line by traveling just down the road, so to speak. Hannah found herself smiling. Yes, she had been through a lot, especially when you considered that from her viewpoint, the trauma she had suffered nearly a thousand years ago still seemed like only a few months ago. But she was finally becoming comfortable with the new future ahead of her. A few years or decades living in this familiar area would help. She could start a family and maybe even meet someone to take as a long-term mate as the template colony's male children became of age. She could also travel as John Prime had left her with the authority to call upon one of the new global-ranged electro jets anytime she wanted. He had encouraged her to see the world and enjoy her new freedom. He had reminded her again that, other than him, she was the only human with the full story of the past and the tragedy of the near-human extinction. He had instructed that Hannah was to spread the word and share her story as widely and as often as she could. With a smile still on her face, Hannah rose from her freshly made rocking chair. There was plenty of work to do, and she had better get started.